good evening, everyone, and I hope you enjoy our Zorba the Greek preamble and details of the Kite Festival, which to which this is uh, a sort of amuse-bouche, and what an amuse-bouche. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor and partner here at Tortoise. It's wonderful to be uh, back in the newsroom doing think-ins, and a particular honour to be um, hosting the great Michael Morpurgo tonight. Um, I was talking to someone uh, who is a fellow fan, like I think just about everyone on the planet of Michael's, and we were trying to work out, you know, if more pergo was a Latin verb and what it would stand for. And I, I delight, you know, I enchant, I tell, uh, because Michael is the storyteller non pari. And what I hope we're going to talk about um, in this hour is not just his book, which has just come out, which I want to talk about. Uh, quite some length, but also storytelling generally, uh, the stories of the pandemic, the times we've been through, the, the role storytelling plays in in human discourse. So, very warm welcome to you, Michael. Uh, it's great Thank to see you, you again. Um, let's let's talk about. Let's go straight and talk into about the book. It's called When Fishes Flew: The Story of Eleanor's War. And I was just chatting to Michael just now, and I said it's obviously a very personal book. And you nodded vigorously. Um, rather than me attempting to vandalise your wonderful book by paraphrasing some of it, tell us what it's about and, more importantly, how it came about. Well, how it came about, I think, it was, first of all, an auntie I had who um, died a relatively short time ago, at an ancient age, and she was just an auntie. That's how we thought of her perfectly kind, very sweet, but we never thought as children that she'd sort of done anything much with her life. And then she died and we found out afterwards that she'd been one of those extraordinary people who worked at Bletchley Park. And uh, probably in the course of her work there over whatever it was, three, four years, probably saved the lives of tens of thousands of people. She wasn't allowed to tell anyone, she never told anyone, didn't know anything about the side of her life at all. That's a sort of something was in my head and it's been in, in my head ever since I heard about it. Then there was a pandemic. And when we had a new take on what a hero was, um, it's a word that's much overused, as we know. Um, but what we all came to understand was that it was the people who did what they did quietly. Um, people who delivered to our door, the people who looked after you when you went into collect your medicines, the doctors, the nurses, we know all that, but also the people who helped from next door, the people who carried things for people who couldn't get out and get things themselves. It's just a remarkable number of people. And they did help um, unrewarded and sometimes at considerable risk. So that made me rethink what I felt about um, heroism. Uh, I've been brought up, as most of you have, on Greek heroes, really. It was sort of, it was a mix of Greek heroes and King Arthur. I know it sounds rather strange, but that's, you know, it was definitely armor and definitely about sort of Achilles, Achilles with Excalibur, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And lots of killing. Yeah. And the white guys were the good guys and the guys in the black armor were definitely the bad guys. We all grew up with this sort right. of stuff in our heads, but those were, the, it was about masculinity. And just occasionally something crept in and a, a woman was a hero. One of them was Penelope, you know, did something really clever, not, not finishing a bit of knitting for 10 years. I mean, wonderful, wonderful tales about um, people being brave, essentially. So that was behind it all. Then I went to Ithaca, um, just before the lockdown, I went to Ithaca, not to write, just to go on a holiday, but it was to read um, an extraordinary new biography by Wilson, she's called, isn't she? Emily Wilson. Emily Wilson. Um, not biography, but the retelling, the retelling yeah. of the Odyssey. Yeah. Um, and I'd read it when I was younger. I've, to be honest with you, I hadn't liked it much. The language was too complicated. And there I was on a beach in Ithaca reading this book. On the very beach that Odysseus had walked up when he came back from being away for 10 years at this war. In legend, that was where he walked up. Homer lived on the hill up there and wrote the silly thing. And I'm sitting there reading this book. So I'm sort of imbued with the whole thing. And then there's a happening, which took me to a place I'd never been before. And it was this. 
At about five o'clock every evening, lying there, the sun would go down and the world would cool about us. Um, and I'd be sitting there reading. Uh, both of us were ready at different things we were reading. And always the same thing happened. At about five o'clock, this Greek family would come down. And it was um, clearly an entire family. There was a matriarch, ancient, even more ancient than me, dressed in black to the ground, uh, clearly a widow. And um, then there were the uh, sons and the daughters and daughters-in-law and the children. The children would go jumping in off the quay. Uh, and the, it was wonderful to watch it. You know, in warm water, people very often just don't swim. They stand around talking. <laughs> it's really weird. And there's this wonderful circle of people, about six or seven of them in their 30s. They didn't go to swimming at all. Boring. They just wouldn't talk. So they stood there in the water, water up to talk, 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 talk. But the main thing was, what took my eye was this ancient lady who would walk along the seashore in the shallows, clearly had taken it her, her responsibility to pick up everything that was there that shouldn't be there. So she picked up pieces of plastic and flotsam and jetsam and put it in a sack. Every single day she did that, um, which my wife thought was wonderful and I thought was wonderful, quietly heroic, I thought. And then one day, this extraordinary thing happened. She was walking along and she bent down and cupped her hands in the water like this. And then she beckoned to us with her head, come over. I never spoke to this woman at all. And so he went over and she had in her hands a flying fish that was limp. And then she looked at us and she was really sad. And she said, it's dying. They come here to die. She spoke. Decent English, heavy Greek accent, but decent English. They come here to die. And there was a pause. And then she said, looking us right in the eye, she said, they talk, you know. Makes you feel unsettled, doesn't it? They talk, you know. So my wife and I thought, there's someone even more doolally than we are. <laughs> and she took her finger. And I promise you this happened. If my wife was here, I could assure you, because she's honest, I'm not, but she's dead honest. <laughs> she was there. And she stroked the top of the fish's head. And the fish went, <laughs> And the fish was talking. <laughs> And we looked at this woman's face. We both of us did to see if she was playing a funny game on stupid tourists, you know. She was not. She was really upset. And she laid it back in the water. And we walked away from there that evening, walked in with our taverna dinner in, in Vathi, the main town there. And we were walking back round the harbour, houses on one side, the port on the other, just talking about nothing else except this talking fish. And in my head already, because of what I've been in, imbued into me by what I've been reading, I knew who this fish was. And some of you will know too. There is a Greek god who can turn himself into any kind of creature he wants. He's called Proteus. And I knew Proteus was trying to tell me something. Don't look at me like that. I did. <laughs> I just had this silly notion in my head that this was a Greek god. And I had this sort of argument and discussion with my wife as walking along. And this is the other part of the story, which is quite uh, equally amazing. We're walking past this house, a uh, perfectly ordinary, rather modernish looking house, not particularly attractive, but right by the road. And as we walked on the pavement, there was a, we saw there was a man sitting on a, on, a, on a sort of veranda. And we were close enough to have to say hello. So I looked up at him, and in my best Greek, I said, hello. And he said, hello? <laughs> I said, you, you're not Greek then? He said, oh, I am, but I'm Australian too. You're a palm, aren't you? So I said, this began a conversation. <laughs> and the conversation went like this. I said, how come an Australian like you is sitting on a balcony looking as if you own the place? It was just a bit of better. But... And he said, oh, I do own it. And then he told me this story, which is beautiful. He told me that when he was five, in 1954, his house and mo much of Ithaca had been um, ravaged by an earthquake, terrible earthquake. 
in which many people have been killed. Kefalonia had the same just across the water. And uh, he had nowhere else, and his family had nowhere else to go except to Melbourne, because they had relations in Melbourne. So they got in a boat and they went to Melbourne. And he said, I spent all my life uh, in Melbourne, and I have one thing in my mind the whole time, that I wanted to earn enough money to put in the bank and then go back to Ithaca and build the house I want to build on the very same place that my mum and my dad had the house. And then I'm going to go and spend four months of every year being Ithacan. And I thought this is extraordinary. I went back home and I did a bit of instant research. First thing I asked the question was, are there flying fish around the coasts of Australia? Answer, yes. I love it when it answers the way you want it to answer. And immediately I sort of discovered that I thought this is, I'm going to, to bring these two worlds together in a story, geographically. I'm going to bring the two worlds of ancient Greek myth and modern Greek history together. Because what I did know also, and I, history really interests me. Most of my stories grow out of either my own history or other people's or of history history. And I do know something, and many of you here will know the history of Greece. Um, it's pretty well always been troubled, but it was invaded uh, in the 1940s by both the Italians and the Germans, and these islands were too. And when the, they had done the terrible things that they did in Greece, they went away, and you would have thought that would be enough to endure. And then less than 10 years after the war ended, the earthquake comes in, wrecks everything. And you would have thought that would have been enough. Nope. Ten or so years later, the colonels came in, one of the worst fascist dictatorships we've had in Europe since the war. And they put people in prison and they kill people and they, they're just fascists. Um, and then the last great trauma to hit um, Greece, of course, has been this extraordinary number of refugees flooding up from, from Turkey and from Northern Africa and coming there and they're dealing with all that and how you cope with it. They've lived on, they're living on the front line of that connection with um, the refugee question. And I thought I will have this history charted by someone in my story somehow. And so all that, I mean, it's amazing to hear you say that because when you read the book, all those elements are in there. Mm. One of the things that gives it um, its potency, I think, is, I mean, this is a, 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 I want to address them separately. Is first of all, your passion for myth. And the book is in some ways a, a rather beautiful Trojan horse itself because it, it gets the reader into the world of Homer, mm -hmm. the Odyssey, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, Aeschylus, you name it. It's all in there. And, yep. the, and the main character, Nandi, who is a, uh, brought up in Australia of Greek descent, yep. goes to Ithaca in pursuit of her missing great aunt. That's right. Who she adores. Whom she adores. Um, and is a sort of, I suppose, a counterpart to Penelope in, in the story. Mm -hmm. So I wish you wouldn't keep guessing these things. It sounds as if I just sort of used these legends. <laughs> you, you happen to be, no, quite, it's all right. you it's have to be quite right, which is very painful. Beautifully done. But I, what I, I want to, to stick on the myth thing because uh, it's, it's very clear, and the role of, of Proteus in it too nails that down, that, that myth means a lot to you. And it means a lot to you in terms of not just sort of curating um, like a, a, a custodian of heritage, but actually you, you see myth as something very alive. Mm. Can, you, can you tell us what it means to you? Why is it so important to you? I suppose it has something to do, all myths, you know, whether we are talking about King Arthur or whether we are talking about Greek myths or whatever. I mean, they are the stories on which I grew up. Um, and they're the stories which have um, guided the way I think about the world and other people all my life, because these are the first stories you really get into. You know, yes, you will have your picture books, and that's fine, and they're very, very good. But these are the first stories you get your teeth into. And we have our myths in this country, you know, whether it's, whether it's Robin Hood, and then we, what we do is we create myths out of history. So the French do it, this with Joan of Arc. Um, we do it with all sorts of people, and then we create modern myths, and it's the creation of myths out of truth that fascinates me. And what fascinates me most is when there is a cusp and we don't know what the history is. So we're sort of guessing at it. 
Well, if you go to Greece, you know perfectly well, there was this civilization and there were these beliefs. We can see evidence of it. We have their plays, we have mm. great stories. We know this happened. And when you're on a place like Ithaca, and that's what was, I'm sure it's why I wrote it. I was just on the place, which I'd never been before. I'd always had to read it in books or see it in movies. Well, those great movies with the puppets, what were they called? Those, do you remember the one with the- Ray Harryhausen's. Yes. I mean, I, I sort of, I, I, whenever they come on television, I will watch them. Stop watch motion. Them. Yeah, I yeah. would have watched them 20, 30 times. It's a wonderful sort of fight. Uh, up and uh, again, there's a temple there, and and the skeletons are up there, and that's right. It's it just you just go, it's unbelievable. And when but they're not just histories, myths, are they? I no. mean, that's the interesting thing. They they tell truths, yes, and that's part of the story, isn't well, it? Well, so does history. That's what's yes. interesting about it. They're, they're they're similar kind of truths, and from the truths, I I make my own truth. Hmm. I mean, it is what is a myth? I mean, it, it's it's not just someone sat down and made it up. It's a growing thing. It grew out of a history. It grew out of a tribe. It grew out of a kind of some storytelling. It, it just grew and grew and developed and developed orally, and then it was put on a stage, and then it was put in writing or whatever. And all the time it changes. And I spent quite a lot of my writing time, um, well, the last sort of 40 years, I suppose, doing as much retelling of these myths mm. as I have writing my own stuff. And I love that. Because what you have, to, I'll just let's, I'll go back to Robin Hood, if I may, um, because it's it's a myth we kind of very yeah. very familiar with. Well, how are we familiar? We're familiar by the, the the interpretations of today, Kevin Costner and rubbish like that, and um, and you know what? With Sean Connery riding in, and and you know he's Richard the First, and he sort of rides out of the forest as you know the, the lion heart, you know, for goodness sake, get lost. And then when you you do know, and we know, many people in this room know. The, the origins of the of Robin Hood are so much harsher mm. and more more difficult to take on board and much much more interesting about the human condition there's a wonderful scene which is it's not a wedding in the forest with Richard the Lionheart and stuff it, the end do you, do you know the story of the end of Robin Hood I'm pointing you I'm going to pay you later on in the evening but the story of the end of Robin Hood is much much better than that and it's in I think it's a 14th century fit a sort of verse poem and um, it, there are only fragments of it. That's another thing. When myths are fragments, you fill in the, you fill in the gaps. At least I like doing that. And right at the end of this version, no one knows who wrote it. No clue. It's just a written down. But the most ancient version of his death is this. He and Little John, who was, of course, extremely big, was in this um, convent and supposed to be being looked after by, by a nun because nuns are all nice. Well, this nun was not nice at all. She happened to be related to someone who is his worst enemy. And what this nun does to the wounded Robin is to leech him. You understand what I mean by leeching? Here it comes. You have a lot to learn this evening. <laughs> um, I can't Stand do by. It. Sadly, with your mother there, I really can't do it to you. But um, they used to, to make you better, you want an aspirin or stuff like that. They would put this little creature on you to suck your blood out. Aren't you glad you're alive now? Okay. <laughs> So this dreadful woman leached him to death. And she was an abbess, okay? Little John knew he was dying. He knew he was dying. And he says to little John, give me my bow. Give me my, my arrow, my last arrow. And I'm gonna fire my last arrow and wherever my arrow lands, there you must bury me. And there you must plant an oak tree over my grave. Who wants Sean Connery when you've got that as an ending, you know? It's a, it, but it is that wonderful thing. It's a tragedy. It's an extraordinary tragedy at the end. And what do we do? We, we don't like that sort of thing, so we turn it into something which is comfortable. It's not a comfortable ending. And most, most of our stories, Shakespeare knew this, he would turn, he would turn myths into what they really were. Um, and it's pretty uncomfortable. Yes, they get under the skin. And I mean, yeah. it, Nandy... Um, in, I, I, mean, I think you've already hinted, so I, I don't think it's a spoiler, um, forges a relationship with Proteus uh, yeah. uh, as a flying fish, uh, who plays a very, very important role in the story, uh, within the story. And one of the things that Proteus the fish says to Nandi is that the role of the gods, or one of the role of the gods, is to keep people in contact with their stories. Mm -hmm. Because without stories, we lose ourselves. Yeah. Now that sounds to me like a, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to say a more Pergo doctrine, but it 
pretty close. Oh, it's a doctrine, yeah. Yeah. So what, why does, tell us why, why Proteus says that to her. Well, I'm going to modernize it completely. Yeah. The, the reason that I think it's wonderful for children to read stories now is because they can read about the lives of other people, other times, and have insights into themselves and other places and other people, which you really can't get from anything else at all. I mean, I know we've got film, and I know we've got this and that, but the, what a book does is it passes on to a young person the responsibility of joining in the storytelling. You bring whatever you've got up here to the and story. And the society telling. exists in time as and, well as space, correct? Exactly. And so right. what, yeah, and what you're, what a, a, a child, even that child there doing his hair now, even that one there. <laughs> He's worried it, about the leeches, can you believe that? Well, <laughs> you know. But what they do pick up from that, and it's from all stories this happens, is we learn empathy. We, we, we learn about what it is like to be um, someone from faraway places, faraway times, someone who's older, someone who's younger, someone who's male, someone who's female, to be a teacher, to be a father. You don't know these things unless you're given some sense of roaming around in their world, of coming to understand them. That happens in heroic tales, it happens in legends, and it happens in the best modern tales. If you read Philip Pullman, you, you, you go into those worlds, you know, and you have to really think through it and then when you finish the book at the end, you, to some extent, become a different person. You have a different take on the world. And that's what stories, that's how stories should touch you. It's not just your heart, it's everything. It's your intellect and your emotions. Emotions are much more important. than we confuse sentiment with emotion in this country. And it's really important with a book that you, you, you're taken along. You want to not just know what happens, but you want to feel it deeply as you're going, going through it. <clears throat> so, for instance, let's go back to uh, the myth of, of, of Odysseus coming uh, ashore on that beach. And here's, here's a, a warrior who's faced all these, uh, these monsters and, and, and managed to, to get home. Um, and when he gets home, and he feels to us enormously heroic, he's been mostly, not always, but mostly the good guy in our heads. And then he does the most extraordinary thing, really. He, he go, and all these, these people who've been waiting for him to die, really, and for Penelope to become available. Um, he slaughters them. Yeah, slaughters them. It's a mass killing. It's horrible. And what does that do? It makes you think really hard about the madness that was in his head when he did that, the reasons for it. You're always thinking a little bit harder than you thought before. And that's what the best legends do, I think. And then the other thing that's important is the sharing of them. Um, the difficulty these days is there are so many stories out there. It's one of the reasons for the great success of Harry Potter is because you know that other people know what you're talking about with that story. It's, it's sort of passed around. It's become a legend in its own right. And that's what legends do. Sort of we all know, therefore, about Robin Hood. We've sort of been there. We all know about uh, King Arthur. Most of us uh, don't know what happened at the end of King Arthur because it's also another tragedy. But what I love is when uh, poets and writers take the story, as Tennyson did with, um, with King Arthur. Do you know the story of Tennyson going down to Cornwall? There's a Don't wonderful know. story. Should I tell you the story of Tennyson going down to Cornwall? I know it's terribly really interesting. I want to tell you. Um, I think that's Tennyson yes. went down to, because before he wrote his Arthurian poems, he went down there to do research. And uh, he was standing on a shore, apparently, of uh, Cornwall, with a, a, a great painter called Holman Hunt, who was a pal of his. And they were standing on the shore and they had identified the, the last battle that Arthur had fought, which was against his son, Mordred. And the reason he'd fought his son, Mordred, because Mordred had rebelled. Uh, I won't go into the Mordred too much because it's quite complicated, though it's never, I will if you ask me later on. What, the knight is young, Michael. What? <laughs> the knight is young. <laughs> What happened was there was this battle. In the battle, Arthur kills his own son and he is mortally wounded himself. And so mortally wounded that an enchanted boat comes into the shore in southern Cornwall. And there are some queens there dressed in black and they take Arthur, wounded, 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 fatally wounded, off in the barge and that's the last we see of him. And this guy, Tennyson, 
and home and hunt would just say well that's roughly on the beach that's where the that's where the boat would have come in and one said to the other i don't know which it was well where did it go and i think it was home and hunt so well there's nothing out there except america and I'm, I always imagine Ted saying, we can't have that, you know. And uh, <laughs> anyway, before you get to America, of course, there's the Isles of Scilly, all right? And so what did they do? They got in a boat the next day, and they went off to the Isles of Scilly. And if you go to the Isles of Scilly, there's a pub there, and you can see uh, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson was here on such and such a date, and he was looking for Arthur's resting place, because the wonderful story is that Arthur did not die. He was saved by those queens, but he was waiting in some cave somewhere to come back when his country needed him. And boy, do we need him now. So in a Weatherspoon somewhere in <laughs> you don't know. the Isles, there is a bearded man who <laughs> is going to come over it's really and establish wonderful. a benign... And then I was looking, because I was rewriting this tale. Because I do rewriting, I told you I do rewriting, and I was yeah. rewriting uh, the sword. You remember the last sword that Bedivere threw back in the lake? I was rewriting all about that. I called it the sleeping sword. And um, anyway, I sort of ended up um, trying to find where King Arthur actually was waiting and my wife said don't be ridiculous michael uh you know it's a legend and so i said you don't know that bit of an argument but then she said we'll look on the map shall we and we spread Isn't out the, the world's map. first arthurian domestic well, it's how it goes <laughs> and she, we looked at <laughs> and then and then she said well where is it and i said okay there and I'm telling you true. I looked by my finger and there was a little island called Little Arthur. Little Arthur. Your back is shivering, isn't it? Yeah. So, we, so we went out there the next day in a boat and we did find a cave. Sad to say we did not find King Arthur. So I made the rest up. Hey there. That's a great story. Um, again, you know, the, the stories within stories. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And in, in the book, um, there's a story about her great aunt, which speaks to your experience of your own relative, Letty. Um, and I don't, again, I don't want to give away what her story is, but one of the things that comes out of it is, is the secrets that exist within families and the means by which those secrets are unveiled and disclosed. And in the book, of course, it's by magical means. Yeah. But I mean, how much, are, how much of that do you think still goes on because one, one thing that occurred to me as I was reading it is perhaps there is less than there used to be of that natural process of telling tales of past generations. I don't know. I think it, I, I really, well, we've all got, we're all sitting here thinking of which tales in our family um, have been half hidden, which have come out and which you'd rather know more about mm. it because it's there. And I had, I'll give you an instance of it really. Um, I think it's still there, still very much there. There's still a lot of unspoken stuff. And then there's the other thing is that a story gets told about someone and it becomes the truth because it's the best truth. Um, and then it gets passed on across families down. I'll give you an instance of it in my own life, which I've always found fascinating, but it's exactly what you're talking about. Um, I had an uncle who was killed in the second world war. He was my uncle, Peter, he was 21 and he was in the um, RAF. And um, I grew up um, as a war baby with the story passed all around our family about how he had died. And he had died, apparently, coming back from a, a mission over France. And his plane had been shot up. And the pilot had been wounded and couldn't fly the plane. And my uncle Peter, Peter Kamatz, he was called, couldn't fly, couldn't fly the plane, but the pilot couldn't either. So he told the other people in the plane to jump out and he would try and land the plane. He never landed a plane before in his life. He was a navigator. So he gets to this airport, a place called uh, St. Ewell in Cornwall. And uh, by this time, three or four people have jumped out, their lives saved. And he, he crashed the plane and both the pilot and he were killed. Hero. So that's what we grew up with. Then, unfortunately, um, a few years ago, 
someone wrote a biography of me. I don't know why I'm not old enough for a biography, but it did. <laughs> um, and anyway, and in it, I had told her the story about my Uncle Peter. And being a good biographer, she said, well, I have to find out the truth of this. So she went to RAF Records and discovered the truth of it. The truth was that the plane was trying to take off and it crashed and they were all killed. End of story. Now someone must have rung my grandparents up and said, he died a hero or something like that. And so the thing grows and so the thing grows. Um, so then of course, when it was in my biography, the truth was revealed. There were some people I think who thought, well, why, well, why are we breaking this? Because he was, you know, he died and he was young and that's heroic. Um, should we have done that? And so there's questions about revealing secrets that come up as well. Um, and I just feel that's, that's in everyone's family yeah, somewhere. No, exactly. and, and most of them, most of them we don't want to talk about. Very much so. Um, the book is the opposite of a polemic, and I wouldn't want anyone to think it, it has a sort of didactic tone at all, but it does have the contemporary in it. Yeah. It's very, and there are two things in it which is very obvious you care about a lot, and I'd love you to talk about. One is migration, because Nandi herself is, you know, <coughs> in, both in a sort of classical sense, but also in a contemporary sense, you know, a great traveller in, in the book. But there's also um, a consciousness throughout the book, and I'm, this would this really would be a spoiler, which I'm not going to um, disclose. But there is a sense in the book of a world where movement is happening a lot and presenting big human dilemmas. So that's one thing. The other thing, which is uh, something you've spoken about often in the past, is is <coughs> the environment. You know, you talked about the old lady cleaning up the beach, and that and that figures in the book a lot. And so I wondered if they, they, you could talk about that, but also perhaps a little bit about your feelings on where that debate is, and even perhaps your feelings about COP. Um, well, I, maybe, maybe the migration question first, I suppose. It does come up, and again, I, I mm. can't talk about it in the book too much because it, it would spoil it. it. Would but spoil I have it. mentioned already that Greece is in the front line of refugees coming up, um, so clearly there's something to do with it there. Um, Right. Again, start not with a myth, let's start with a history. Um, we're living at a time when we're, we are debating as a society uh, what we should do about refugees. Interestingly, they're always called refugees, they're not called people. That's the first big mistake. Um, they're all sons and daughters and fathers and mothers, and you put the refugee there and suddenly they're categorized. That's and we know what happens when that uh, is uh, just simply becomes how they're spoken about. Um, I become connected to it, I think, because of one or two historical facts. Um, and it's one I want to tell you about because it strikes me as being very relevant to today. Because it was a long time ago, it's not generally known, I think, that in 1914, the beginning of the First World War, 240,000 Belgian refugees, think of that number a moment, got in boats and came across the channel. We were at war. We weren't the fifth biggest economy in the world and boasting of it. Uh, we were at war and all our, our, our energy financially was going into fighting this war. And yet what happened? They were welcomed in. They went to our schools. They went to our hospitals. They were looked after. They didn't know at the time that they were going to be going back after four years because Belgium was free again and the war was over. They didn't know that. And then I compare that with how we are now, when we have to struggle to allow a thousand children from Afghanistan or from Syria to come and live with us. How, uh, so I'm going to show you, how do you feel when you see on the news that the Royal Navy is being deployed to stop people in dinghies using shovels as oars. How do you feel about that? Ashamed. Not of not the Royal Navy. No, no. But the people who send them there. And, it, and of course, it's all part of, uh, it's all muddled up, this stuff. It's muddled up with Brexit. The whole thing is muddled up with that. We're spending our time now pointing fingers at people and saying, actually, they're your responsibility. Mind with them. Mind with us at all. And I went, the reason I'm so, I, I, I'm so 
not angry, just upset by it. I went to the jungle. You remember this place in outside Calais? Some of you will remember it very, very well, where 3,000 or so, they were usually boys, mostly boys, um, from, from Sudan, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from all over. They, they came there, pitched their horrible plastic tents. They were living in this city of sewage. It was just completely disgusting. I went there because there was a theater company called Good Chance Theatre, who said, come and see it. We see these desperate, desperate people who are trying to escape every single night, being beaten up by the French police if they don't get there, usually not getting there, some of them being, being killed in the process. And the rest of the time, they are simply waiting and waiting and waiting for their opportunity. Why do they want to come to England? Why are they wanting to come to England? Because many of them come with English as the only other language that they speak. And they've also heard it's a wonderful place, and compared to where they've come from, it's paradise. So they're there, they said, come and look, and they've set up a theatre tent, and they invited these boys to come and tell their stories. It's another thing about the power of telling stories. Um, their songs, um, they, they made plays, they danced. And I found myself in the end sitting in a tent with a 12, maybe 15 uh, Afghan boys between 12 and 18. They didn't speak my language. I didn't speak their language. And you were just sitting there. And I think all of us thought, well, how do we, how do we connect? Um, we didn't have words. We couldn't tell stories. But we did have songs. So <laughs> these, these boys all sang songs. And I was told by the interpreter later on, they were all about home. It's all about home. Everything was about home. And they turned to me and they said, <laughs> sing us a song. Well, English people struggled with that sort of thing, but I sang them a song. Um, it doesn't matter what it was, I sang it. And in singing it, what you were doing was signifying of actually, you know, I'm with you in this. And they felt that, and I felt their need. And so I went back, and in fact, I've just come back from Paris now, from welcoming. I don't know if you see, have you heard about Little Amal, any of you? Little Amal is, is, is wonderful. It's, not, it's like the fish, you think I'm going to tell a story. It's a three and a half meter high puppet made by the same people who made the puppet of Joey in War Horse. And this is a girl called Little Amal who comes from Syria. And they are walking, these puppeteering teams have been walking all the way from a refugee camp in Turkey, all the way up through Europe, through Greece, through Italy, all the way up, and the current they were in France, and meeting people, meeting children, really passing on this message that refugees are here because they need to be here, not because they want to be here. They would love to stay home and have their life where they've had their life. And these are the children. They're talking about the children. And this is a 12-year-old girl, and she's got a mother in Manchester. And it's in the story they've created. So it's very, very powerful. And the more I think about this, the more I think it's the, apart from the climate, which you've mentioned, it's, it is the great, it's the great story of our time and we're failing. And I'm filled with shame that in a country where we are refugees, we are refugees, massively, massively, people have come here and come here over the centuries. And we are all religions, we are all colors. Um, we come from all over the globe. It's what makes London particularly so wonderful, or Manchester, the cities, because that's where people have come to. And what have we done? We've benefited from it. I mean, I just, I, you just need to take one refugee. Can I just tell you about one refugee of course. who I knew really, really well? As an example of what's positive. The one called Judith Carr, who wrote... Tiger came to see. Tom's Sausage. No, what's it called? Tiger King, Tiger King and the other one, and there's another one, Mog. Mog. Do you know Mog? Yeah. Mog. Jew <laughs> Jewish, left Germany. Thank God, you know about the Hitler stole pink rabbit and stuff like that. Thank God, got out, came here, lived amongst us, told us her stories, and it's an example of how these people have enriched our country throughout the ages. I'm not talking about now, and I, I'm passionate about the fact that we should treat them with respect, and if we can, with affection. 
but we should not be dismissive of them. And yes, that is in the book somewhere. I hope it doesn't come over. I mean, I make a bit of a speech now, but it's not in the book. It's a story. Oh, in the book, it's uh, it's it's yeah. it's part of the warp and weft. It's not a. Um, I'm conscious that I'm I'm hoggy, Michael, as I want to do. Um, who would like to ask a question? Well, we're not supposed to ask questions, but it's a rule gently enforced. Is there anyone who would like to make a point or ask a question, Michael? Um, the master storyteller, all yours, very rarely. If not, let's go to William Jeremy, who I know is online and has a point he'd like to make. William, are you, are you there? William, hi. I'm here. Hi, Matt. And nice to see you. Michael, fantastic that you're with, with us, huge fan, and uh, have loved all your uh, work, have, have got a sort of big picture question, which comes from a friend of mine who is a rather distinguished neurologist. And uh, Mike, uh, no, no other Mike, uh, asserts, reckons, thinks <laughs> that this generation of youngsters, i.e. people, I don't know, between 10 and 15 particularly, mm. are the first in a very long time, perhaps forever, who have not been automatically worried about the authority of either their parents or their teachers or adults generally as people to be slightly worried about, perhaps scared of, perhaps uh, concerned that there might be a God almighty thump or both metaphorical or yeah. Uh, or or uh, a vocal, and of course this is in a particular uh, strata of society. Yes, but I just wondered what you might make of that, given all your work and you've spoken very and written very eloquently about the life that you lived as a child, speaking for your generation too about. Uh, that th those in authority. Um, so, any thoughts about that? Yes, I have really. Um, I think about it a lot because I was, I think, maybe brought up at the last. Um, where has he gone to? He's disappeared. I can't bear people disappear. He's, he's still with us. He's in the he's in the matrix. There he is. <laughs> Will you not go away like that? It's very, very... <laughs> no, William, William is with us. Part of anything else is extremely discourteous, just disappear. <laughs> no, no, William is a stalwart of tortoise. He's, he's um, always with us. No, it's... I think I was maybe in the 1940s and 50s, the last generation to be brought up where there just was authority everywhere around you. I mean, you, you did what, by and large, what your parents said. You might not have liked it, but you did. Um, I was lower middle class, living in London. Um, you played out when they told you to come in from playing out, you came in. If there was a policeman, you did what you were told by and large. You were frightened of your teachers because they had punishment um, in their hands and you knew they did. There was the ruler, there was standing in the corner, there was shame and all the rest of it. There was fear. There was a lot of education by fear. Mm. Um, and since I truly believe as a teacher and as a father and um, grandfather now, the worst thing in a child's life is, is fear. Mm that inhibits everything, love, it inhibits creativity. Um, and as a teacher, I, I'll give you an example, I had a wonderful uncle, wonderful uncle who was also a teacher. And I think he almost, he helped me to understand that it was all right to do without using authority. If you might have had authority because you were older, but you didn't need to use it. He told me, he was a great teacher, the headmaster of a comprehensive school when they were quite new, new places. Uncle Francis Camouts, the brother of the one I told you about. Wow. And Francis Camouts um, told me once, because he knew I was very strong on teaching and in, enjoyed it. And I said, well, what is it? What, what do you think is the main, what is it we should be passing on to, to our children? How should we be passing it on? And so well, the first thing is that they must feel uh, you are a friend. And he would pause. You're a friend. You're not an authority, you're a friend. They must know that you are respected, that the child is respected and is a friend. As a friend respects a friend, you say you respect a child. And he was very, very clear about that. And I think it's, it chimed with everything I feel about education. 
And at the present moment, I mean, we, it's, it's just at this moment, it's really important because we have brought fear back into the classroom uh, and into schools. Um, different way, we don't beat people anymore, thank God. And we don't necessarily stand them in the corner, I shouldn't imagine. But we create fear. Mm. And what's the fear? The fear of failure. Mm. And that is massive in schools. It's not mm. just massive amongst the children, it's massive amongst the teachers. And it's massive amongst the schools themselves. They're all looking over their shoulder. Um, and that's, that's not an atmosphere in which to bring up children. I mean, when I was encouraging, which I did a lot, I, I taught in the primary schools, my last job, and I don't think my children learned any mathematics at all. I just read books and stories. And we didn't need any spelling and there were no tests at all. It was like, I was just, what's that? Um, it was quite like that, that wonderful film. Um, you know, the teacher who got sacked, it was played by, sorry? Mr. Chips? History Boys. Say again? History Boys. That was good. That was brilliant. But no, Dead Poets Society. This Dead... Dead Poet Society. <laughs> I knew Dead you were on my side. I could see it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, both of them, actually, but particularly Dead Poet Society. It's this business of having them with you, you know? Mm -hmm. but the minute you impose an examination system, which simply points the finger and said, on this side of the line, great. And on that side of the line, well, and that was there when I was young. We all went. I took the 11 plus exam. And I failed it. And I would have gone to a secondary modern school, as it was called. But my auntie, who was also a teacher, paid my fees and I went to a public school. It didn't save my life, but it made it a lot, lot easier to have smaller classes, great teachers, music, drama, all the things you couldn't necessarily get at the school down the road. It's not changed as nearly as much as it should have. And that, so they're great teachers, don't get me wrong, they're great, great, great teachers out there. Um, but they are up against it constantly because there's this pressure. And the pressure is about results. And you know, and I know, everyone knows, children develop at a different pace and in different ways. The most important thing I think is they learn at school something that they love to do, can do, and they feel enabled. So they come out of school empowered. So one thing I got from my school which I, I will be eternally thankful for, is that I left my school in Canterbury, walked out of it, and I really thought I could do anything. Now that can turn into arrogance extremely easily and very often does. But it just makes you feel, I'm okay, I can do stuff. And I, my, Clem, my wife and myself have been working on this project for the last 50 years called Farms for City Children. And the idea really was to get kids down, very often the kids who were not succeeding at school and they would come down and they'd work on this farm and they'd experience nature at first hand and they'd experience work at first hand and they would feel useful that they could make a contribution you know so what does that give you it gives you respect you get some farmer saying to you you cleaned that shit out really well <laughs> and it's it's great you you could see them growing and the teachers brought them back year after year after year because they could see this profound effect it was having on them and still has on them and that kind of an experience is something We've got to give to our children. It's this self-confidence. Yeah, you know, I can do this stuff. Self-worth as well. Not, you didn't pass that exam. You're not good enough to do this. You're not good enough to do that. We, we've gone the wrong way. We've got to steer it up. Why did you ask a question that provoked that sort of thing? <laughs> no idea. Um, meanwhile, the chat has been ablaze with two principal themes. One is when you're going to become prime minister, which is obviously a personal decision. The second, which is slightly more um, sort of a question of taste, is uh, Katie Vanek Smith, uh, fellow co-founder with James Harding and City of Butler, wants everyone to stand on the tables at the end, a la Dead Poet Society, and say, Captain, my captain. Uh, and Mark St. Andrew over there, whose job it is to make thinkings operate uh, you know, well and smoothly is, is I'm afraid against this. So I, I just I'll offer you that. I, I, I Mark means well, he's thinking of the future, Katie's thinking of the present, you know. But I see there, um, speaking of Captain, my captain, uh, my fellow editor and partner, Liz Mosley, is brandishing the microphone. Uh, and I wouldn't want to stand in the way of a, a Mosley brandishing a microphone. Michael, it's been such a pleasure to listen to you. I feel like I've been in the most lovely nurturing therapy for 40 minutes. I've got an 11 year old and a nine year old. 
it's okay. It's not. It's not that bad. And my we've come through it now. Yeah. And the my my eleven year old um has come through happily his phase of only valuing stories that are true. So we've come through that phase, and there was a, a, a you know he sort of came home from school one day saying, "I mean, I don't think it's right that they don't clearly distinguish between the stories that are stories and the stories that are true, which yep. is a different point, but a, but yeah, a good one." Yeah. So he's come through that, and but now he has a um, very different attitude to stories, depending on the format in which the story is delivered unto oh. him. By which I mean he's allergic to a book. But he's really okay with a graphic novel, cartoony type thing, an yep. asterisk or whatever it is. Yep. And of course, he's thrilled with anything computerized yep. or verbal that I make up and tell him. Now, do I need to worry about that or should I just get over myself and let it go? No, I think you should stick to what's very lovely is you mentioned the two things that I loved. One is being read to by my mum, um, which really gave me a, a, a love of stories in the first place. And this is because and I expect you do the same. Um, you read the story and, and the child knows you love it. Otherwise you wouldn't be reading it. And that, it's, it's like mother's milk. It's, it's really passed on. That's critical. I think the, the other thing really to, that, that's important is that we don't worry it too much. Um, if they like stories from you, that's enough for the moment. I grew up on, um, because I hated words on the page. I'm not sure if I was dyslexic. I really wasn't sure, but I hated crowded words on a page. They frightened me. The other thing that frightened me was that I knew at home with my stepfather, he'd ask questions about it. And he wanted all the time for me to read way above um, my ability to comprehend both the words and the story. So he would put in my hand age eight, um, a Dickens novel, you know, Hard Times when you're eight. I have found a way around it. And the great thing is that children very often find a way around difficulty. Uh, I came across a series, which is exactly what your child is talking about. Um, it was called Classics Illustrated. It was American, I think. And they were about 60 page graphic novels, but all of them retellings of the old stories. Sometimes it would be be a wolf or whatever, and other times it would be Dickens or Hardy. And it was great because the stories were told in pictures and I wasn't fond of the words. But what I did get from it were the stories, you know? And I think it's the, there is a time when a child will go on, but when, if you push it, if you put hard times in front of them and there's little, he's never going to look at Dickens again. And I, I, mean, I did something recently which got me into an awful lot of trouble. I was accused of dumbing down. It's a favorite thing of quite a lot of people. Um, I wanted to um, retell Shakespeare plays. You know, Charles Lamb's Tales of yeah. Shakespeare, which people a long, long time ago were all brought up on. Little kids were brought up on the stories of Shakespeare. And there was a good reason for it. The reason for it was that you one day will be walking past the theatre and you'll see Macbeth and you want to go in because you like the story when you, you knew the, what the tale was. Anyway, I chose the 10 best tales I felt and um, I told them and told them as well as I possibly could and the books coming out next year and uh, the RSC are involved in it and they're reading them. It's lovely. It's just a wonderful um, idea of bringing these stories of Shakespeare with the name Shakespeare to children very young, hoping that a, a child like yours will read it and say, well, wouldn't it be great to go and see the play of that mum? And then he'd be sitting in a theater and then there's another kind of storytelling, which is every bit as good as reading, you know, a great play or indeed a great film. It has a really profound effect. Look at us all um, trying to remember that film and or remembering, I mean, it, 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 things stay in your head and it's what stays in your head and becomes part of you and part of your memory. So I think, it's wonderful you've done the, the reading. That's just what every parent in the country could do, because it's so hard for the teacher to engage reading with children unless the parent, to some extent, has prepared the ground. I, I bang a drum about this, but since you asked the question, I'll bang it again. What's really critical is that at school, we catch the children who don't have what you're giving to your child at home. So half a class, and I know this because I've taught them at least half a class, won't be being read to. They'll be plunked in front of the telly or playing a game or whatever. 
if you can do that, um, you could create a world where every single school, primary school, from three to half past, every afternoon, before they go home, the teacher reads a story, and it's completely normal to do it. And here's the big thing. You never ask a question after it. They go away with a story in their head, thinking about it. And then you go on with it next day. And if you don't do someone else's story, you make up one of your own. But it's the teacher revealing to the child how much the story means to him or her. The best letters I think I've ever had from um, children are, are things like, oh, we, my teacher just read uh, the butterfly lion to us. And it was the best story ever. But you know what was bestest about it? She cried <laughs> and handed me the book to finish the reading of it. You're thinking, what a teacher. You've got the guts to cry in front of a child, to read a book where you know you're going to cry because you <laughs> cried last summer term anyway. <laughs> and, and it's wonderful. It's, it's really about the courage to open yourselves up, and the best teachers do that. So what does the child learn from that? But this matters, you know, it's not just a school exercise. It matters that that human being, who maybe I like and rather respect, I'll try reading myself, but it's slowly, slowly catching my I'm not a great reader now. I read for research and I read poetry, um, but I have a problem with reading. I don't mind confessing this, it's the end of the day. I don't mind what I confessed really. Um, <laughs> I find reading other people's books, fiction, fiction I'm talking about, really irritating. <laughs> uh, and it's because of this. If they're bad, particularly if they're children, I really hate the fact that bad books are going in front of children because if you fail with children because it's a bad book, why would they ever want to read the next one? They're doing damage, really. But if they're good, I'm thoroughly pissed off that I think. <laughs> You know, that's the worst thing. And there are some books out there and you think, oh, God, why do you think at first, you know, it's what, written? What do you wish you'd written? Oh, I don't know. Everything from Treasure Island onwards. I mean, the, <laughs> the great writers, I mean, you know, Ted Hughes is Iron Man. You can, you can reel them off. And then you think to yourself, oh, I'd love to have... Oh, there's, do you know The Man Who Planted Trees mm. by Jean Jonah? It's a beautiful book about a shepherd who plants acorns. In, and it was written in the 1930s. And it's now the most relevant book as you could possibly imagine, it's about recovering an entire landscape through the planting of trees. And it's beautiful. It's utterly, utterly beautiful. And um, no, I, I don't know. I, I, think you're doing, I think you're doing fine. I think Liz is going to be Education Secretary in the new government, actually. Well, in my government. Yes, absolutely. I mean, well, I, I, I'm... So, I want is that to be... all right? Should we do it? Yeah, we'll, no, we'll, we'll do a deal. Um, Three o'clock to half past, all right? <laughs> no, I mean, we yeah, laugh about it. Good but hours. It's, but it's sort of important. If we're not, we're not giving the children what they need, and the books aren't there. We've got libraries which don't have enough money f f for books. And you think this is Shakespeare's country, it's Philip Pullman's country. We, we've got this glorious language. It's the best thing we have in a way to share, not just with ourselves, but with the world. And it's our greatest export. No one ever talks about it, but it's extraordinary. And, and here we are, we haven't got enough books in our own, our own libraries. And if you don't give people the tools, they can't do the job. And that's the truth of it. So tragically, we're, we're hitting the hour, which makes me very sad, um, because uh, to be honest, I could listen to this man for hours. Uh, there are very few people who I think justify the word magus, but he is a magus. And, and when I told my children I was going to be hosting a thinking with them tonight, they're 18 and 20, but their childhood is just made up of more pergo. So there was a there was a lift in their eyes, which is just magic. And it is thank you for sharing that magic with us, Michael. Really, um, and and do do buy this book; it's terrific. Um, but uh, and also book tickets for Kite when they they go on sale in in November, right? yes, um, because it's going to be an amazing occasion. Um, it's going to be a moment when you celebrate the end of the pandemic and world peace and everything. So, um, <laughs> uh, and that's only the first day. Let's get, can we get to world peace first before we celebrate it? We've got time. So, but before we go, Michael uh, would like to read a poem. Uh, yes, and which I, is um, the moment some people want to leave because I'm not Roger McGough and I'm not Michael Rosen. Even better. So um, <laughs> to close out, uh, we'll 
have know, Michael, and, and we can report him at the end. Thank you so much. Um, I tell you what happened. I said so first, this is what's lovely when someone, when you're seventy-seven, and asks, someone asks you to do something different. It's really nice. And I was asked by some a wonderful man at Decca Records um, to write the poems for a new performance on CD by the wonderful musicians called the Canny Mason family. Seven of these extraordinary children who learnt their music at a state school and got together, and they are the most magical musicians. Um, and they wanted for their first CD to make a CD of the Carnival of Animals by Saint Sans. And as you know, there are poems that go in between each piece of Saint Sans music. Um, Ogden Nash has done it, other people, poets have done it. And anyway, they decided they'd like to ask me to do it. And, and I don't write poems. I told them I didn't write poems. Um, and he said, yes, you can, Michael, grow up. So I um, wrote these poems, and there's one which is immensely suitable to this occasion. Some of you might have guessed it already, if you know Saint Sans. Um, it's called Tortoise. You people are obsessed with speed. You know you are. You know the fable? Well, of course you do. The hare with the speed ego took a nap. And I won. But what the hare didn't know, nor La Fontaine, was that I don't like racing, never saw the point of it. I'm happy, we're happy, being slow. Slow is good, slow is cool. Imagine a world where we all go slow. No need, no wish for cars or trains or planes. Imagine an Olympics where the slowest wins. Tortoises on every winner's podium, gold medals round our necks. No need, no need to build any more houses. We carry ours with us, and we are still here after millions and squillions of years. You may worship speed, but you'll wear yourselves out. We never do. We never have. Take it easy. Go slow, and you'll go happy. Take it from a tortoise. There we are. Bravo. Thank you, people. Very nice to you. Can I just say one thing about that book? I didn't talk about it, and I should have talked about it. There's the most marvellous illustrator. Um, and if you don't buy the book, look at the illustrations. A man called George Butler. And George Butler is like a sort of a modern Paul Nash or Eric Revillius. He's a war artist, essentially. And uh, he spent lots of time in Syria and Iraq and places drawing things that you and I don't necessarily wish to look at, but done beautifully. And since this since this book is so much about the wreck of buildings and it's about invasion and stuff like that, and yes, war, um, I asked him to do the drawings and they are just astounding. They really are extraordinary. George Butler, don't forget the name. I think he's going to be, he's going to be the person who in art, I think, um, helps us to remember, if we wish to remember, the sadder side of what's going on in the world today. And don't forget to buy a copy. No, definitely, they're good for the pension. And see you tomorrow at 8.30.